Hey, this is His Word Unveiled. Um, love that you've joined me. Love that, that you chose to watch this, that you chose to walk this out with me today. So this ministry, His Word Unveiled, has been um, pretty crazy. So what this ministry is, is we have been walking through the Word of God, just diving into His truths and really allowing the Lord to unveil Himself to us through His Word and allowing His truth, allowing who He is, what He wrote to us, what He's speaking to us to change our lives, not just sound good and not just make us feel good because we're reading it, but honestly change our lives, our entire way of living, um, that we can encounter Him as we walk with Him in this crazy thing called life. So with that, today's reading is pretty crazy and it's pretty radical and it's crazy awesome. So I hope you're as excited as I am about this. Let's get this thing started. Today's reading will be Numbers chapter 16 and 17. So go ahead. Um, find a quiet place. Maybe it's a place that you consistently go every day, daily with the Lord. If, if you don't have a place like that, find a quiet place today and be so purposeful with meeting with the Lord and allowing him to be your resting place. Go find a secret um, hidden place that you just position yourself in the very center of who God is and allow his presence to just wrap you up. And as you read, let him speak. Let him reveal, let him be who he is to you. Make it intentional and full of purpose, full of who he is. So go read that, I'm praying, and we'll do this thing. Oh, Lord, we love you. We thank you for being our strength and carrying us through when we feel like giving up, when we feel like life is just heavy and life is hard and at times painful and we feel like we cannot go on, that we have no strength, no energy, nothing left. Father, thank you for coming on the scene of our lives in those moments and carrying us. Lord, thank you for blessing us when we choose to press on. Thank you for having a blessing, for, for doing an incredible work right behind the wall. We may not see it, we may see it as just a dead end, as a brick wall, but right behind that wall, we are choosing to trust that you are working up a masterpiece for us, within us, and, and how to work through us. Lord, what you want to do and part of this calling and part of just our purpose sometimes is behind that wall. So Father, be our strength and be our energy and be our wisdom, be our just perseverance where we just press on. We're just choosing to wait in you and believe that the best is yet to come, that you see us, that you are our rewarder, you are our blesser, and you are up to something great. May we never, ever say we're done. May we always want more, always keep moving, even if it's just a baby step at a time. Lord, carry us through, drag us if need be. We need you. Lord, we cry out to you and say, help. Help us, Lord. Just carry us through those hard, long seasons. We love you and we believe that in you is, is true, full, abundant life. Be with us now. Um, just speak. Speak what you choose to speak to us and help us to be ready. Help us to be ready to, to hear and, and to be prepared to move and to be moved. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so good. He's so, he's so faithful. Guys, when we're just, when we're just tired, I'm like, he's so real. Like, I'm tired. This is not easy. Like, it is not easy to get in the Word and study intently with purpose, with this, this, you know, desire to learn and not just to read. Man, this is a hard, but it's so worth it. What's in this? I mean, I'm exhausted. I'm so exhausted. I don't even know, though how much God is teaching me. I don't even I don't even get how much is being just planted in my heart. And things can be planted in my exhaustion as long as I I am I am keeping my heart pure and I am I am seeking the Lord with just a simple desire, nothing short of just desire to know him and to discover more of him and and to be moved to just to just choose to be obedient. There's power in that. Even when we feel exhausted, there's power in that. There's real peace in that. There's real blessing in that. And and that's why I'm choosing to press on. And I'm just encouraging you. If you are at that point, just keep pressing on. Just God's blessing you. 
It's not that you're going to get to the blessing. He's blessing you now. He's doing something great in you now. So let's keep pressing on. Let's keep choosing to walk this out in and with him. That was a side note. That has nothing to do with our chapter. So God's just good like that. Okay, but let's jump into our reading. So this is a long chapter. So I'm going to just briefly recap what is going on. So we're reading about this cat named Cora. Um, and when I say cat, I don't mean like the animal. I mean like a, a man, cat, Cora. Um, anyway, we're going to read about Cora. So Cora, it says in verse one, that he is the son of of Ezar, who is the son of Kohath. So Kohath, remember, he is the main guy, the main leader of the Kohathites. The Kohathites being those who are able to hold, carry the, the holy objects, the Ark of the Covenant, the golden lampstand, the um, table showbread, the, the altar of incense, um, that they were put in charge, they were chosen and appointed to tend to those things, those holy, holy things that were found in the holy place. Like, big deal. Huge deal. Like, this Kohath guy, he's a, like, right? Like, super big, super, like, for real. This is, this is big stuff. So his grandson, Korah, is the main guy in this chapter. And Korah rounds up some of his buddies, you know, and convinces them to, to be a little rebellious and to, to really question this leadership that the Lord has, you know, appointed. So we have Korah, and he brings along his buddies, Dathan and Abiram, and we see those names just in verse 1, all of this in verse 1. They rise up before Moses, and they take 250 leaders out of the congregation. So Korah not only takes his, you know, his dudes, his close personal dudes, but he convinces 250 people to gather with him. And by gathering with him, that means going against Moses, going against the leadership that God has ordained for that time and for that purpose. So then what Korah does, it says they rise up before Moses. They approach him. They assemble, assemble together, it says, against Moses and Aaron. And they say, you have gone far enough. Like this, this has got to stop. We're here to stop this. Who do you think you are for exalting yourself up and saying that you're the only holy one? The whole congregation of Israel is holy. And we see this in, in verse 3, that he's just laying this out. The Lord is in their midst. Like, so stop saying that you guys are the only holy ones, that you guys are the only ones with rights and able to do these certain things. And so 250 guys and then Korah, you know, in all this rebellion, leading this, leading all this, approaches Moses and, and accuses him of something. And remember, a few chapters ago, we read that, Moses is defined as the most humble man, like full of humility. And we see that. We saw that played out when Miriam had leprosy after she was accusing Moses of stuff. And Moses, in his humility, prayed for her healing. We see just this characteristic. The, like, humility is huge with Moses. That's who he was. He was a humble man. We see Korah, you know, accusing him then of exalting himself. We see that at the end of verse 3. Why do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? Like, bam, he's saying, I'm putting a stop to this. Like, this ain't cool. Like, look who's coming up now. Like, watch me be leading. Watch me be speaking and confronting you on this. Thinking he's hot stuff. So then Moses, this is how he responds. And it says that he spoke to Korah in verse 5. And he said, tomorrow morning the Lord will show who, he, who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to himself. Even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Love this, that Moses doesn't sit there and have a conversation with him and say, whoa, you need to simmer down. Here's why I'm the leader. Here's what God has done in me. Here, you know, have you done these things? Did you part the Red Sea? Moses doesn't, you know, get in defensive mode and, and start elevating himself higher than Korah. What he does, he says, God's going to choose. It's, he's, he's keeping himself low and he's saying, God's going to choose. God will show. God will reveal. You know, God will do all of this. He is doing this, but he's, he's going to reveal to all of us. This is all God's work and God's doing and God's appointing. It's all about the Lord. Love this. So then Moses speaks and says, okay, take censors. You and all, all of your people that you've gathered, all these people who are in agreement with you, are willing to, to follow you, all of them grab censors, um, put fire in them, it says in verse 7, and lay incense upon them. And then he says, you have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. And then he goes in and says, is it not enough that the Lord has chosen you? Your whole, this whole tribe of Levi, he has chosen you to be near him, 
to do these holy things, to deal with the holy objects, that God has chosen you from the rest of, of the congregation of Israel. Is that not enough? You want more? Like, is this really, is this greed, is selfishness, pride? Why are you letting this run, like, and rule over your decisions right now? So Moses is confronting him in that and saying, this should be enough. Just look what God has done for you. Like, why are we, you know, as humans, why do we allow our flesh to just rise up and get us into this trouble where we're, we're grumbling about these positions and these blessings that God gives us because we want more? Like, do we, we're really, like, claiming that position and saying, oh yeah, this is nice, but I really deserve this, or this would be nice, or why don't I have this, or why am I not able to do this, or why hasn't God called me to do this? We're, why, like, why? why? And Moses is like encouraging, challenging, whatever you want to call it, saying, is this not enough? Like, can we focus on like what God has done? God has chosen you. God has chosen you to do this task. He has called you out from the rest of them to, to do these things, to be in service in this way, to be blessed in this way by being in nearness to, to the Lord's presence. And, and just laying it out like that and confronting, and confronting him by not lifting himself up, but again, lifting up the name of the Lord, lifting up his goodness, bringing, bringing them and, and, and causing them, challenging them to fix their eyes and their focus on the Lord. That this is the Lord that he has chosen, he has blessed, he is doing, he is moving. That this is about whatever the Lord, the Lord desires. Um, then they continue to make just excuses. They continue to be defiant. Korah and his, this assembly, they're, they're defiant and they're um, being rebellious. In verse 14, Indeed you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor have you given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Would you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. We just hear the pride. You know, Moses calls them and say, Dathan and Abiram, you know, come up. Like, come and, and listen to this command. They're like, we're not, we're not going to come up. We're not, we're not going to do anything because you haven't done this and you think you're so much better than us, but you haven't even given us this. We, are, we haven't even made it into the land that you say that God's going to give us. Just this defiance, this rebellion, just being so stubborn and selfish and saying we deserve more and just so much focus on themselves on what they want. So again, this, you know, tomorrow, just bring your things. We'll, we'll present, everyone will present themselves before the Lord and we'll let the Lord do his thing. So verse 19, thus Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the doorway of the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. So the Lord's like, here's what's up. I'm here. So everyone's going to see what is going to happen and how the Lord responds to this. Then the Lord we see in verse 20 speaks to Moses and Aaron and tells them to separate themselves. So Moses and Aaron separate from the rest of this congregation. Congregation, I'm going to kill them all off. Then we see them pleading and saying, Lord, like, would you destroy the entire congregation for those who are sinning, for those who have rebelled um, against you? So then he says in verse 23, he responds that way. The Lord said to Moses saying, speak to the congregation. So speak to them saying, get back from around the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. So he is setting, you know, we see that he sets people apart because of their obedience. He sets people apart because of their disobedience as well, because of their sin because of their defiance, because of their stubbornness and their selfishness and, and their pride. He sets them apart. And he says, okay, speak to the congregation. Tell them to completely separate. That these three people and their households are um, left alone. That no one is around them. Then he says, it says in verse 28, um, Moses said, by this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds. For this is not my doing. So he's saying, this isn't going to be me. This is going to be the Lord. And this is how you're going to know. Um, so then he says, if these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, this is verse 29, then the Lord has not sent me. So if this is something you guys have seen before, then you'll know that the Lord has not sent me, that I'm not supposed to be leading. I'm just, you know, these men are right then. But then he says, but in verse 30, if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs, and they descend alive into Sheol. Then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. Then we see in 31, 32, and on, it says, As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open, and it swallowed them up. The earth opened its mouth, it said, and swallowed up these men and their households and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So we see Korah and his household. 
Datham and his, his household, um, Abiram and his household, that where they were standing, the ground split and the earth swallowed them up. Alive, they went down to Sheol and the earth covered up over top of them. Done deal. Done deal. That, that was something new, it says, entirely new. If the Lord does something entirely new, not something like we see. You know, and that really touched my heart in thinking, how many times do we expect God to do something that we know? You know, oh, we expect him to bless me in this way. We expect him to call me into doing this. We expect, you know, and expectations are so good when we should come expecting, expecting that the Lord will do, expecting that the Lord will provide, expecting that the Lord will bless. Those things are so legit, so healthy, like straight up what we need to be doing. But we really need to reflect on how we are expecting. Instead of expecting God to do certain things, we can't get in that rut of expecting those certain things to happen or him to call in a certain, call us to do things in a certain way or lead us in a certain direction or to a certain place. We need to come expecting, just expecting simply for God to be and for God to do, for him to be faithful in whatever that looks like. We can't allow our expectations of knowing that God is all powerful and able to do anything, we can't let that truth and that assurance to lead us into, okay, he's going to do this for me. He's, he, you know, I expect him to do this because this would be really cool. Or I expect him to do, do this because this would be really great for my family. When we put so much of our flesh and our own mind in it, we just need to come expecting that, hey, God, Whatever happens, God's in this because I've been obedient and pursuing him. That's where our expectation should come. And I know that's kind of off track with what, what this is and saying that he's going to bring out an entirely new thing, but that Moses in this position is expecting the Lord to show up, to, to bring about, um, you know, he can do and make all things new. This expectation of, hey, whatever happens in this, God's going to be all over it. And and God revealing to him that, that he can make all things new. And that means blessings and, you know, things in our life, like good things, but also punishments and consequences, that those things can be new. What we need to focus on is not how God's going to do something, but that he's going to do. That expectation in God is faithful, that he is capable of making all things new, that it's going to look different. It's going to, it's going to be different. It's going to be just wrapped up, um, wrapped up in him and in his capability. So we see this very thing happen that again, the ground just splits and they're swallowed up and this thing that they've never seen and they're, they're over and done with. And then we see the whole congregation starts freaking out and running this way and that and saying the earth may swallow us up. So they're running around frantically. We see in verse 35, fire also came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering the incense. So those who turned against Moses and, and were disobedient to the Lord and following him and chose to listen to the grumblings and the selfishness and the pride of Korah, that though the ground, there wasn't a newness of punishment for them, but that God consumed them all with fire. That their disobedience, the consequences were so real, so quick, so present, right then and there, that the whole congregation saw what was taking place. Then we see, um, we see in verse 41, jumping down, but on the next day, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron saying, you are the ones who have caused the death of the Lord's people. Right after the congregation saw what the consequences of disobedience, the consequences of all of this yuck flesh just coming to the surface and, and leading them in their decisions, the congregation just saw this, all of Israel just saw this punishment and saw over 250 men just die before their eyes in a new way, in a way they've never seen before that that was clearly God. And yet we see on the next day, it says in verse 41, all the congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, blaming them for causing such a, a tragic death that, that all these people died and it's their fault. How we blame other people instead of just coming to the Lord in repentance and realizing, hey, I want to make sure that I'm right, that my heart's right, that everything is, is good to go um, with obeying the Lord, with following, with following the Lord. 
Then it says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying in verse 44, get away from among this congregation that I may consume them instantly. Then they fell on their faces. Moses and Aaron, or Moses said to Aaron, take your censer and put it in fire from the altar and lay incense on it and bring it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for the, for them. For wrath has gone forth from the Lord. The plague has begun. So even after, you know, we see atonement was made for these people who were grumbling after just seeing these, these, these workings of the Lord. So atonement was made. And after Korah and Datham and Abiram died with all of their, their families, all of their household, with 250 other men who were disobedient after their death. And then we see 14,700 people died from the plague. Then the plague stopped because Aaron made atonement for the people. We see all these people dying. All those people did not have to die, but they chose disobedience. They chose to go against against what the Lord was speaking to them. They chose not to wait, not to trust, not to cling to the Lord and to stand on his promises. That all those people did not have to die. Those consequences did not have to come. And why we choose to just take those those shortcuts, that we choose to, to take the way that seems easiest, best, that things that we want, that we deserve. And the consequences are so heavy and so intense. We see that so many people died. We see in verse 49, it speaks of that 14,700. But those who died by the plague were 14,700 besides those who died on account of Korah. Then Aaron returned to Moses at the doorway of the tent of meeting for the plague had been checked. So again, in the humility of Moses and Aaron, they're making atonement for these people who are grumbling against them, who are being stubborn, who are not willing to trust the Lord even after seeing the Lord punish and lay out these consequences and... We just, we see, you, you sin, these punishments come, this bondage comes, that you're full of restlessness, all of that comes with that, but obedience brings blessing. And the people saw this, they saw a distinction, they saw what was set apart, they saw those who were rebelling against the Lord and what happened to them. The people were listening to the Lord and what happened to them, life and death as clear as day, yet they're still grumbling. May we not get that way. May we remember what he's done. May we reflect on what he is capable of of doing. So this kind of rolls in naturally into chapter 17 where um, again Korah was raising up like hey why are you only holy? Well there was just more of the Lord just coming in in chapter 17 and saying okay I'm going to be clear with who I have chosen. And so all the leaders we see in, in chapter 17 all the leaders took a rod and placed it in a certain place. Then that next day they saw that Aaron's rod bloomed. It blossomed. And that was the one that the Lord chose. So the Lord was making this so clear. He made it clear with Korah and, and the people even who grumbled and what the Lord was commanding and what he was committing to do, that he was giving them grace and even speaking what he expected and what was going to happen, that this is all laid out. God does not hide himself from us. And in this, he is clear. He is revealing who he has chosen to use. And that was so clear that it was um, Aaron. In verse 10, we see, But the Lord said to Moses, Put back the rod of Aaron before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, that you may put an end to their grumblings against me, so that they will not die. Thus Moses did, just as the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Um, this is just God saying, I am God, and who I choose, I choose, and who I call out, I call out. And, and that I've called everyone in different ways to do, to just be obedient. That Lord, the Lord is in control and he can have his way. And when he has his way, when we allow him to have his way, then we see the abundance of life. We see the richness of blessings. We see this. It's so clear. The Lord reveals himself to us. He unveils these truths to us so clearly. And we can't just read them and say, oh, that's nice. That, that makes sense. But we have to put them in our hearts and, and allow them to be applied to practical everyday situations in our lives. We need to understand that the grumblings of people, that this wasn't crazy sins again. Now, Korah was bringing people out and, and the selfishness and pride, but we see just grumbling. The simple idea of grumbling, even after they saw that, the people grumbled. You know, and they're, they're grumbling about, about who you know, who, who is in charge, who can lead, who is holy, who does this and that. Grumbling is such a sin because when we grumble, that means that our eyes are off the Lord, 
that we're not trusting, we're not waiting, we're not, we're choosing not to hear the voice of the Lord and trust in his power, his protection, his provision, and the way that he calls out. And knowing that my calling looks different than your calling and that we need to be obedient in what the Lord calls us to do, whether that means we're a missionary to a third world country or some some preacher in a huge church, or that means we're, we're, we're a janitor in a school who has the impact in, in, in reaching kids and, and doing and being the best that he is at what he is called to do. We have to be obedient to our callings and we have to trust that the Lord knows what's best and he fights for us on our behalf in, every, in the way that he calls us, it's for us. He knows us, he designed us, he created us. May we be obedient and not grumble but wait and choose to rest in, in the position that he's given us and do the things that he's called us to do with all of our hearts with his understanding that God is good and he is faithful. That's all I got for you today. Um, I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you for walking this out with me, for joining me just on this incredible journey of learning more about him and, and just hearing him speak, allowing him to be unveiled to us and, and allowing that to change every area of our life. May it change you, this, this incredible transformation that changes everything, every day that we are choosing to walk in that and stand on the promises and truths of God. Um, yes, that's good. He's good. That's all I got. Hope to see you soon. See ya.